Welcome listeners, you have tuned in to Tribe Radio. I am your host, Marie Germain. Today, I have a special treat in my longest interview yet. Find time to sit back and soak in the wisdom, the clarity of my guest, world-renowned futurist Gerd Leonhardt. In this hour, he speaks of the very serious challenges businesses and brands face. He offers solutions. On a more somber note, he exposes the ploys of controllers on internet freedom, SOPA to be clear. The Wall Street Journal acknowledges Gerd as one of the leading media futurists in the world. Powerful, incisive, Gerd is simply delicious to the ears. Keynote speaker, founder of the Futures Agency, advisor to top corporations and governments, author of five books, The Future of Music, Music 2.0, The End of Control, Friction is Fiction, and The Future of Content. You've guessed it, Gerd's background is in music. But today, he is a top game changer, inspiring entrepreneurship and guiding us into a prodigious digital world. Let's meet Gerd now. Good morning, Gerd. It's such a pleasure to have you here this morning at Tribe Radio. Now you in Switzerland. I'm at home in Basel, Switzerland. You know, I work from my home office, and it's, uh, it's winter here. You know, it's not really snowy, but it's quite cold. To help introduce you to everybody, I wanted to use a little metaphor. Many years ago, I was in Manhattan, and I went to buy a box of cigars for a friend, and I went to the Dunhill Humidor. I believe it's on um, Avenue of the Americas. And um, I was met in a dim room with a 25-foot ceiling by a gentleman that reminded me of Charles Dickens, and I was sat down before a glass table and a lot of cigars uh, pinned like butterflies under glass. And I proceeded to ask him um, very pointedly that I wanted a Monte Cristo number two. And he climbed up on a ladder which slid down a wall in this enormous room with a thousand drawers and knew exactly where this particular cigar was at the top near the ceiling. And I think of you as this ubiquitous renaissance social media maven uh, transforming everybody uh, in the book business, the music business, the movie business, at least attempting to guide them from rights management into the future, the connectedness. And you know, for all of these uh, different industries and their paradigms, which drawer to go and pull out. I see you on the ladder going to the specific drawer or many drawers to help them transition into the future. So I don't know why I thought of that metaphor this morning, but you are the master humidor man. I like that, you know, but the thing is, I know what the cigars are, but I can't make them smoke them. <laughs> they, they take them out, they look at them and they feel intrigued, but they don't dare smoking them. <laughs> oh, what a great response. And... So, Gerd, one of my driving uh, reasons to interview you today was to help the big brands and the small brands, the new brands, the emerging brands, all of them, because I can tell from my conversations with them and my work with them that they are all very nervous about what's ahead, and they're scattered uh, trying to adopt social media they don't know quite what that is. They're overwhelmed by it, and I can understand it because every time I learn a new app, I pull my hair out for a new few days. And they don't really see the return on investment because they tend to stare at the apps rather than the people using them and listening to them. So there's a lot of work to do there, and I want to talk to you about how they can transition as these brands that you've helped the the music industry especially which you um, have such a history with in fact the whole entertainment industry um, these brands can be digitized the books can be digitized the movies can be digitized but um, in in Canada Blue Notes jeans and Kicking Horse Coffee as an example of brands what do they do how how do they begin to make that transition because their issues aren't quite rights management although some of the larger brands are on top of you in terms of using their logos and stuff 
What do you have as a suggestion for them coming into the future in terms of using social media? How, what, what parallel can you make between the rights management issues and the, the physicality of their brand? Well, I mean, of course, first of all, it's not about digitization as much as it is about becoming human, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a, an oxymoron. But basically, when brands go online and they show themselves uh, to people, they become sort of human brands in the sense that we can tell who they are, the people, who the people are. I mean, everybody knows, for example, what kind of brand Virgin is because of Richard, right? Uh, Richard Branson. And, and so basically the brand becomes touchable at that point, which means it has more chances of success. Uh, and we see that with the biggest brands that we see now, Google, eBay, Amazon, Apple, and so on, that they become human, even though there are many of them are about technology. And the other thing is that, of course, the, the name social media sort of, sort of implies that it's like a, a cheap marketing budget, like a, a building a better mousetrap, you know? Uh, and when clients come to me with that view, then I, I don't really want to talk to them really because really what we're, t what we're seeing on the web is that the web is becoming a social operating system. So there's transparency, there's honesty, that it's very difficult to lie on the web because everybody knows that they can fact check and cross check and, and get opinions, right? If I say that I played with the Rolling Stones, you can find out it's not true very quickly and, and my plan will be, will be hampered. So basically, it's not about social media, it's about what I call the social operating system, you know, the, the whole context of conversation. And to be frank, you know, many brands that, that you see every day in your, in your everyday environment, they're not that interested in talking to their users or buyers or even clients. Uh, many of them are interested in just selling, right? And I mean, just shut up and buy like iTunes, you know? <laughs> and that just won't work. And once we realize that it won't work, then we have to say, okay, if I'm a pharma company, if I'm an insurance or a bank or a retailer, I have to figure out how to become human and have conversations and get engaged and then I sell something. Yes, you uh, make that distinction in your notes, many of your videos and audios, that uh, selling is just not uh, a model anymore. So that's to be, in fact, you say yelling is dead, uh, to quote you. And you also say things such as formerly known as consumer. And you also say advertising is becoming content. So yes, I mean, when you, when you think about it, especially like this, I mean, we didn't have a lot of choices before the internet because the television told us what was real, what was not, uh, which is Fox News still trying to do that. Uh, but basically, we, we didn't have all the options of being able to consult different sources or, or get together online or build Etsy's or Amazon's or Ebay's. You know, it was all top down. And now, all of a sudden, we still have top down and that will continue. But we're also, we have this many to many system, right? So my friends tell me that this electric car is a good one to buy, and I look at it, and a lot of these things happen online, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they happen in digital, mobile, social environments, and the brands are scared because it removes this utter control mechanism of whoever yells the loudest sells the most, you know? That's what the past was. Uh, and now we still have lots of yelling and chaos online, but it's very, it's very hard for them to dominate in this environment. So my new book talks about this, how we're moving from this sort of ego environment to, you know, big companies, big opinion, big marketing, uh, to the eco environment, which is not about ecological, it's about being interconnected and being the sort of many to many, right? Ah, yes, well, you've just taught me something here. I understand you're using the word eco as another ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's basically the, uh, the, the idea of the ecosystem is very important for commerce, right? Because basically, when you are the ecosystem, say Walt Disney or Universal Music or MTV, when everybody has to move along your guidelines, right, and you dominate in a marketplace, then you don't have to care what people say because, you know, what choices do they have, right? Mm -hmm. It's my way or the highway, right? But in, in, in this system that we have today, we're all of a sudden interconnected. And you can see right now what Greenpeace is doing, for example, protesting Volkswagen as a bad ecological brand, whether it's true or not, you know. They have to respond. They can't do anything else, right? And this is a, a major issue with retailers. They have to all of a sudden pay attention to what everybody else is doing as well, right? They're no longer just, uh, you know, sort of uh, Roman empires.
And frankly, if that bodes well for the um, formerly known as consumer <laughs> citizen, if that bodes well for them, then it has to bode well for the uh, the marketer, the brand owner. So um, that's a good thing. But well, I mean, you could argue, of course, in that context, that uh, in a way, because of what we have now in a truly digital society, we don't need marketing in in that definition that we used to have in the age of TV, right? Because their marketing meant you show up so many times in my life that I can't help but not look at your stuff, right? Through TV ads and outdoor advertising. But now, because we're now in a network society, people mention you to me. It's a whole different process, which I can't always control the same way. That's like, you know, Twitter news network versus CNN. So TNN versus CNN, you know? Well, indeed, the, that noise, as it's also called, uh, that intrusiveness, um, I think people had it had wear out. We called that uh, in advertising. They had wear out before, but right now it's opt out. They, they don't, uh, I mean, they just click out. And, um, you know, that's the shift, I think, is opting in and following. And you've said that. So maybe you want to say a little, th a little thing about that, how... Um, if marketing is a, 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 a withering paradigm, uh, selling uh, is dead for sure, or yelling, selling, yelling could be a metaphor. <laughs> um, how, how do they begin to market themselves in the long tail, uh, lest that be cut short by SOPA, which we'll talk about. But, um, you know, is, is the new game what Gary Kawasaki calls enchanting them, um, being exceptional? Because you do talk about the context, all of the context around the brand that allows you to bundle in the music industry and the film industry. And um, I want you to make a case for that. Maybe we can parallel that for brands. Talk to me about that bundling, that extra added value that helps people in you know obsessed with rights management and entertainment talk to me about that bundling and that added value that can help them leave the internet free yeah i mean i think that if we take this analogy and we say okay it's basically uh, imagine the difference between a magnet a big magnet and handcuffs uh, you know, in, in the old days of commerce, there were essentially handcuffs. You know, if you if you have cable TV, then you're handcuffed to that deal. And if it's down, then you don't watch, right? And if you don't pay, you don't watch. But now on the internet, you know, it's about attracting people to come and do something with you, like Netflix, right? Uh, where I can opt in and out and I can probably get it for free if I try it or I can get it outside of the US. But it's a it's a mechanism of attraction, right? And in the in the media business, it's been like this for a long time. That essentially, because of the uh, control of distribution, you had to be inside to consume, right? Inside of cable, inside of the DVD, inside of iTunes, and if you if you weren't inside, you couldn't consume, or at least you were illegal, right? So that hasn't helped them because basically, I can always be on the outside and still consume, right? Because that's the nature of technology. With physical products, of course, it's quite different, but there is a comparison there and basically saying that it's all about the, uh, as, as Guy Kawasaki says, the enchantment, but I call this the sort of the, the, the feeling of um, attraction, the fact that you like this brand, that you love the brand, some people would say, uh, that makes you decide, you know, all the added stuff makes you decide why you buy something. It's not the core. When you buy a new car, you don't count the gas mileage as the number one factor. Some people do, but most people don't. They have a certain feeling about a BMW, right? And that's why they buy a BMW for 95% of the motivation. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a perception issue, right? I mean, this, of course, in my business, that is my number one driver of my own business is perception that I'm the right guy. And then I hope I can fulfill it, right? <laughs> but, you know. Absolutely. There's... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've made some arguments about perception. I, I believe that perception is not everything anymore because of the transparency of the internet. And I, a lot, I think a lot of brands were romanticized beyond their actual value, <laughs> especially as the, uh, like Seth Godin calls it, uh, work their way to the bottom <laughs> in reducing prices. In fact, Jeffrey uh, Hazlitt, Hazlitt and I uh, kidded about how you can't cut costs anymore. There's no more me 
meat on the bone. There's not even any marrow. They've ground down the bone. So uh, I think the value of brands have been romanticized beyond their delivery. So yeah, I mean, but it's also true, of course, that the the obsession with profit and short term uh, gains has taken over to a very large degree, not just brands, but also with government and other things to where you were basically saying, you know, whatever works tomorrow, let's go do it, right? Because you don't, you don't want to really plan for a long time. But if you're looking at brands that have been built, like Harley Davidson, or like Southwest Airlines, or Virgin or others, right? Uh, where the value has been built, and, and there's a strategy behind being social, it's not just a fig leaf. Right. Yes, uh, <laughs> fig leaves. If, you know, if you make fig leaves, you're definitely going to be naked. Right? <laughs> that, that's my view, and therefore, that don't even try, uh, because you know that's. I mean, that's happening to Kenneth Cole with the Twitter thing and with everyone. You know, these are just fig leaves for better, better mouse traps, right? Uh, and, and and if we do that, then it really doesn't make any sense to even go there. Oh, you're a man of such great metaphors. I, I know that when I listen to you, I, I just relish on your metaphors. They're just, you're so, uh, such a great communicator. Thank uh, the, you. <laughs> you're welcome. I, I don't want to appear unctuous, but uh, I, I'm probably one of your bigger friends, I think. <laughs> and increasingly <laughs> so every moment. <laughs> So what you're saying is, uh, perhaps uh, use a metaphor that the past is very much an arranged marriage, and now we have to swoon them with real virtue. <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying is, like, I think actually it gets more complicated because, as you know, there are arranged marriages that work quite well. For example, in India, right? They're not in principle to be uh, denied. Or I mean, in my point of view, this of course is a cultural question, right? Uh, they do work sometimes. So what I'm saying is, like, uh, it can work. I mean, look. Apple completely controlling every single environmental factor of how they sell, right? And it works. Right? Well, you're right. The algorithms can pair a couple together properly, uh, the customer with the brand. You're right. <laughs> it, it, it can work. I'm just saying yeah. that the chances of a controlled environment working in today's uh, fast paced, interconnected world are so slim that I wouldn't want to try it. Mm -hmm. because, because the chances of, of having a more open environment and a more sustained conversation and, and a growing of the brand are probably much larger, you know, which doesn't mean that it's a rule. It's just sort of a, a worldview, I guess. Mm -hmm. One of the big overriding messages that I got from all of your materials really is um, the debacle, the war that is on. Um, and I don't want to say between the past and the future. I don't want to do that. It's too banal. But the, the difference between, you know, the hegemony of the industrialists and the large corporations, the control versus the actual truth about the web which is access so it's control versus access and selling to them i think your task has always been tell me if you if i'm um, quoting your your task in life properly that you're trying to persuade them that there is revenue and profit and longevity and sustainability in access and finessing that access which isn't costly by the way versus holding on to the lock-in rights controlled past. Am I correct that that seems to be the great challenge for you and for corporations and big brands? Well, of course, that's a, that's a challenge for everyone, really. I mean, this goes all the way down to individual issues. Clearly, you know, we all like control. I mean, you, you don't want to feel like you're out of control, right? But we also know that when you're obsessed with control, it doesn't do you any good. I mean, we, we have experienced both, right? So there, there has to be a balance of when you are and when you are not and, and so on. It's like when you have kids, that you learn that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how control and trust is a mix, right? But if you too, you know, the music industry is a perfect example, which has been hammering on control for the last, you know, 15 years on what we're not allowed to do. And by result, the only thing that really works is Spotify, 
which they're just about to destroy again, because you know they can't agree on how much money they should pay for something they don't have, which is customers. I mean, it, it's a bizarre situation. It's like, uh, and and in this case, you can say that the free market economy hasn't worked, right? Because it hasn't produced an outcome uh, when there are sort of landlocked situations, right, between labels, artists, and 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 uh, fans, right? Um, so there needs to be impetus to change it. In my view, that is the government's role is to also say, guys, this isn't working. You know, come up with something that works or we do it. Well, let's talk about that. I hope that you, they are seeking you out. And if they're hearing this, they better contact you because you ought to be in this dialogue on January 24th, the great uh, D-Day for uh, SOPA. I forget the full meaning of the acronym, but the Privacy Act. Um, sorry, the Piracy Act. <laughs> yeah, Stop Online Piracy Act. Right. Stop Online Piracy Act, which is the um, the movement against the, pri uh, the, the Piracy Act, um, is occurring. And Eric Schmidt and uh, Sergey Brin, uh, Jack Dorsey of Twitter, Reid Hoffman of, of uh, LinkedIn, I'm Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, all of them are, are facing this and fighting against SOPA. And uh, they certainly should be seeking you because you can't just argue something. You've got to come in with solutions. You can't just say, you can't just go into the debate and say, this is going to destroy the internet. It's going to destroy the greatest resource the world has known, the greatest GDP productivity. You have to also say there are solutions. There are ways to satisfy everybody. And I can understand you're having difficulty getting them to the table. Well, I mean, uh, this, this, has, uh, this has clear parallels to all the other issues that we're facing, including, of course, uh, the Keystone Pipeline and, and, and oil issues and all these things. I mean, if you're looking at uh, what's happening on the Internet, this bill basically is not at all about piracy, right? It's about who gets to control what happens, right? And it's the people who are currently making the money that want to control the new money. And it's very much like the oil companies run U.S. Congress for the same reason, because they want to run the energy of tomorrow as well. And this is why they donate so much money, uh, get so much money from the oil companies to vote for these laws, right? But in the end, if there's no common benefit to those to those rules, right? The benefit goes to the top 1%. Uh, and, and that is where the injustice comes in, in my view, is that the... Uh, the amount of money spent on lobbying for these issues like SOPA or other 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 issues that I just mentioned, you know, is so huge that, that the people who are actually concerned, which is 99%, don't get to say anything because they don't have the money to, to pay their way in. Right? And, and this is why I think that it's that the work of the EFF and many others is absolutely crucial in, in this balancing process, right? Because, yes, you don't want to give everything away for free on the Internet, but that's not what we're saying. I mean, basically, the U.S. has always been on the forefront of uh, making room for entrepreneurship, you know, with the DMCA and, and other options, even though there are issues there as well. But this now is going back in a whole different direction where we can essentially say that's exactly the same as lobbying for more oil and more carbon and maybe more nukes. Even. Well, to quote to Chris Anderson's uh, long tail, that's been one of the, the, the wonders of the web that is beloved by everybody who is on the web. And I would say, um, I think 90% of the people on the planet are on the web, if you include mobile devices. They're talking about a blackout already. The app owners are talking about a blackout as a protest, but I well, think... Well, I mean, they're, they are, they're clearly asking for civil disobedience in this case, right? Because, mm -hmm. when I mean, this is essentially a law like, like we have in China now, right? And this puts uh, the U.S. on course to compete with China as far as censorship is concerned. Um, and that is really, uh, it's embarrassing, right? And it's utterly ludicrous for a country with that sort of spirit that the U.S. has uh, uh, to even consider these kind of measures, right? So I think in the end, this is this is something that is really going to polarize the sides. And maybe that's a good thing if it happens. Uh, but clearly the outcome, as, as France has shown, you know, the Hadopi law, which is the three strikes uh, that basically says if you've downloaded three times and were caught, then you get disconnected, right? In France, that's in, in, in place, and it's a law. didn't do anything for legal business commerce. It has given millions of dollars to lawyers and people in government, 
but nothing at all to the creators. So clearly it's, it's just a very, very bad idea. So somehow because um, they have failed to relinquish that control through regulation, they're trying to keep the control, but it might, excuse my expression, bite them in the ass, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you can draw the parallel here. Clearly, you know, this is, yes, you can buy a victory, right? You, you, can, you can do these things and you, you can buy laws to this effect, right? But in the end, you will still lose. And, and this, of course, is what we can learn, you know, for brands. You can probably buy your way to the airwaves and you can buy your advertising, but you can't buy your way into the heart of the buyer and the consumer. We're still not going to do this. Oh, that's uh, well we're still said. we're still not going to buy for those prices. We're still not going to subscribe. We're going to vote with our wallet. And if there's one billion people around the world uh, 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 that are refusing to be part of this, and you can't do it, and that's the end of the story. Well said. Um, I I think that uh, this is bigger than actually the creators of music and and books and entertainment. You have corporations like Nike, as Sony uh, finally um, dropped its support of the Privacy Act, but um, you have brands like Nike that are supporting it and many others and you wonder well, what's their play in the whole the whole thing because they're not digitizing their shoes <clears throat> but in the end they control the mention and use of their brands and so my mind goes into what could possibly happen to get people in trouble in terms of Nike and I can see um, a new development in terms of people using the word Nike in their texting, in their M M SMS messages, or even showing a picture of a shoe and getting charged for it. So there's a whole new revenue stream for them. So I can see now people starting to refer to Coca-Cola perhaps as that brown syrup I can't name. And then somebody else responding and say, oh yes, I know, I had a glass of that brown syrup I can't name. So there's a, a false belief system going on in their minds that through their own brand equity, which by the way, 90% uh, of the world trust peers about any product, artifact or brand and not the brands themselves. And I can tell you that the top brands don't have the love, don't have the affection, and it is effectively them that are driving this piracy act. So they'll end up with nothing, I think. Well, in the end, I think that uh, it may very well turn out, as, as Cory Doctorow describes in many of his books, you know, we, uh, in the end, we may just say, look, you know, whoever support this and made it a law and gave millions of dollars to congressmen uh, to vote for this, right, we're not going to buy from them anymore. Uh, we're not going to buy from these supporters of this law, and if a lot of people do this, it will really hurt them. Right? I totally and, agree. And we'll take our money somewhere else. Like you know, right now, I'm, I'm already considering how I can cut out all these guys from my life. You know, if if this law becomes a reality, because it's really appalling to see how much they uh, they think of their own sphere rather than the entire system, which leads back to this idea of ego versus eco. Right? I mean, in my view, any company that's not willing to build an ecosystem of like-minded mutual relationships, you know, doesn't deserve to be part of this thing. Well, I totally agree. I'm glad we're talking about this because the future of the brand could be shifted by this ever so temporarily because I have a feeling if they get their way, it won't last very long. They'll, they'll be apologetic following that very shortly. Let's pretend that the long tail remains and thrives and let's pretend that this isn't happening and talk about the future and talk about how brands can build their ecosystem because again you were talking about opting in and building a context around brands and getting them in conversation how can you sell can you how can you stop selling uh, and get more uh, context and engagement what what are the moves you see them doing let's pretend we're we're um you know blue notes jeans and they have stores but they also manufacture these wonderful jeans which i'm wearing right now by the way <laughs> they're canadian brand and they're wonderful and they make american eagle jeans look like nothing i think that the the main thing is that in this <clears throat> day and age with uh, very soon we'll have probably three billion people connected to the internet and then maybe in two or three years four and a half billion uh, from the total seven billion that we have now basically all the brands become publishers of some sort even if you're a mining company 
or if, if you're a bank or an airline, right? You publish things about yourself, and there's a certain belief system that comes across. For example, again, we think of Virgin as being a sort of a snarky brand, you know, irreverent. Uh, and so people who are irreverent like to buy or go with Virgin Airlines, you know. There's sort of a fit there, right? Uh -huh. But um, in, in many ways, uh, brands become publishers, and therefore they need to create something that is really that is publishable. For example, BMW had a film series five years ago called BMW Films, uh, which created a huge boost in the revenues, but didn't have any logo in it whatsoever. But uh, it, it just showed what it's like to be in a BMW, but it wasn't a commercial. So it's this idea of creating context. Uh, of uh, being reachable uh, in as, for example, um, as Pepsi has done with the Pepsi Refresh project that you may know about, uh, seeding new ideas. I think Pepsi gave something like $30 million to startups to come up with good ideas to make the world a better place. You know, those are all sort of contextual things, right? And I think uh, that lots of marketing and advertising money will move into creating context that is a benefit for anyone that's interested, for example, car companies coming up with ride sharing uh, services, you know, many of the big car companies are getting into car sharing. I mean, that is not the car business is to share a car, but to own a car, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but now they get they're saying, you know, what doesn't matter if people share a car, they still buy one. Right? So I mean, this is a larger view of the world rather than saying, you know, we sell DVDs or, you know, we sell jeans. You don't sell jeans, you sell a lifestyle of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and Levi's has been very good at this, right? Uh, and so as Heineken, for example, with beer and the sponsoring of music and as, you know, this is not new, but because of the, the way that the web is evolving, all of a sudden this is moving center stage now. It's not, it's not an extra thing anymore that's like an also do it's becoming a, a requirement that you publish you have to create context you have to talk to people you have to be conversational and you have to lubricate i call this lubrication you have to lubricate a market by creating something of benefit that transcends a possibility of buying so you know it's not enough to just sit there and say yes yes now you can buy this you get five dollars off you know that's not big news but but to say that when you buy this then you can create something else that has benefit beyond this purchase of a good product, right? Mm -hmm. but like, you know, we buy a Harley Davidson because clearly, hey, it's Easy Rider, right? It's uh, it's the culture that, that we're buying. Uh, I don't have one, but I can imagine how people would perceive that, right? Right. Uh, and and so, so that is really the job of a marketer now and of a branding person is to say, okay, how can we create this context? that is really attractive and powerful to people. And the most successful brands, including Google, for example, uh, in, the, in the tech space, you know, they have succeeded at being brands beyond, you know, some individual product. An interesting term that um, we both used and that you've used a lot is flowing, the constant stream of upselling of experiences. And I don't know if a lot of the um, legacy brand people understand that that's what the web is. It's it's a life. It's a stream. It's a constant stream. Yeah, this is a, the challenge here. Really, is that that a lot of brand managers, you know, if you're a traditional brand manager, you're thinking of a transaction, you know, a unit sale, and and, and then whatever gets the unit sale to come in, you say, okay, I count the units, right? It's like in the music business, it was all about CD sales and download sales. You count the units, right? But now you don't count the units anymore. You count the amount of attention, which is what we call flow, right? Uh, you count the amount of uh, attention that you can meter in various ways. And then the outcome translates into units, right? Uh, or in some sort of way. But if you only count the units, then, then it's not enough because the metrics are flawed, right? And if you're going to be measured by selling units, then that's the problem. You have to also be able to sell and to make a benefit out of the flow. Absolutely. The analytics are still very important. It's funny how we always talk about search engine optimization. It's important, but uh, uh, those are you know, there's a lot of qualitative work still on the web and we need, uh, sorry, quantitative work on the web. We need more qualitative analysis um, it's better to analyze a response from a thousand people, you know, the intended tribe to some experience, that particular stream that uh, uh, they experienced that day. 
than to say there are a thousand coming. You know, it's the qualitative that's uh, missing. And the algorithms uh, have their own hegemony. Um, Eli Pariser has talked about the filter bubble, as uh, probably has your friend, futurist Kevin Kelly. And in fact, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web, is concerned about the filter bubble. So there's that issue as well. I think a lot of the, the data that we need to, to draw from the internet is very quantitatively oriented and not qualitatively oriented. So it leaves us to our own devices to say, hey, you know, we've struck a note. This this upsell of this stream is is going to help us define the brand and create that experience. But well, basically, I think you have to uh, you have to have more belief and less and less sort of uh, reliance on stats, right? Because, I mean, look at Steve Jobs. He, his job wasn't about uh, uh, doing focus groups and then saying, okay, let's make an iPad, right? It was all about beliefs, right? And I think if we are, uh, if we're going to a society to where you can say that it's based on some sort of mechanical formula uh, as to who likes what and who's going to buy what, and if we're going to live in a world of cloud and peer index and all that stuff, you know, that is not human. That won't work because it's. This is just one piece of the equation, and if we confuse that and we're, we're taking the numbers as the real thing, and then we do everything according to the numbers, and we become the machine, which means it will just crash, right? Because there's a disconnect between you know most people are are humans. They have emotions, right? They want to be creative. They want to be touched in some sort of way. And if you're using a mathematical formula only, it will completely derail, in my view. Uh, is to have effect because this is just one piece of the equation that you also use yeah yeah i know uh, the numbers are, are faking sentiment aren't they well I, I think there is a lot of things you know i use numbers but you know if you're saying we're going to do this because of the numbers you know then then you're uh you know, you're missing that important step to say well what kind of chemistry do we have here right what could happen if we did xyz i mean we don't base our purchase behavior on facts. We just don't. And that is a, uh, pretty much a given uh, a scientific value is that people are saying, you know, this is all part of the decision. But in the end, we make an emotional decision. In many ways, we make that decision in the first two seconds of appearance. Right? So, so, so therefore, you can argue about all these things. But the bottom line is that it's all helpful. But in the end, you have to have emotional impact. Yes. Right? Yes. As a brand, as an artist, as a writer of some sort, and this is why decisions get made. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the end, you know, it's always about trust. I found that in my entire career as a, a branding, marketing, communications consultant, previous advertising agency owner, <laughs> um, it's always been about trust. If you can get the customer, um, the recipient, to trust, and right now what's happened is the, what, what um, the legacy brands used to think they had as trust is now genuine, authentic trust between people. And um, how to get uh, you and your friends to be talking about something in a positive light is probably the most powerful source of trust that you can generate on the web and stopping the yelling, stopping the selling, stopping the, the perception, stopping creating ideas and foisting them on people, but going out, you know, inserting yourself into a conversation uh, humbly and listening and watching and learning how these people feel, live, what is their lexicon, I think is is uh, going to inform the qualitative that will drive the quantitative. Yeah, so, I mean, if you, if you see, I think that the one of the curses here is really that we're thinking, okay, if we're, um, if we can't trust, then we also probably can't be trusted. Right. And, and this is a, a typical example, of course, from the media business, you know, that there was no trust whatsoever that consumers would do the right thing and, and create value, monetary value for the creators. It's completely bogus, right? I mean, 98%, mm. 99% of, of all consumers are fans, right? They want, They will do the right thing. But you have to trust them in a way to do it in their own way, right? So you don't give trust, you don't get trust. And this is one a typical example, of course, of, of many brands who are looking to protect and secure 
uh, and to nail down what they have with patents and what have, rather than going the other way and saying, you know, we, we put this out because we trust it will come back like many other brands have done. And of course, without being idealistic, you know, this is really a question of the worldview, right? I mean, if you are a pre-internet worldview, then you could control it all, right? It's, it was possible. Mm. But, but, but now, essentially, because, you know, the internet is putting a, a, a giant detonator on this issue of control, whether it's control of media or digital content or brands or logos or, you know, even, it doesn't even work in China, even though they spend billions of doing so, right? Uh, so that is just a question of what you believe. And I think that when we come down to the bottom line is that in a network society, we have no choice but to be interdependent. You know, otherwise, you know, we get ostracized. We become like a, a a satellite that flies off into space. Oh, I totally agree. That's a very good point. Trust isn't uh, just something that happens between peers. Uh, you're right. The the, uh, the corporations need to trust the consumer, and uh, I think there's an inherent lack of um, due respect to them. That's a very good point. Uh, so two way street trust, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, again, because because we're now in this big switch to saying this concerns all involved parties, and this goes for media, it goes for bands, it goes for environment, right? Rather than th saying, okay, these guys should pay these guys, uh, or you know, have sort of mechanical setups. You know, now it's all interconnected. So if we want to make this work, if we want Spotify, which is the my view the leading streaming music service, if we want that to work on a global scale, then we have to allow them to do it under conditions where they can survive. You know, otherwise, we'll never get to see what it could have been. This is like having said in the 1920s that radio is illegal. Mm. You know, <laughs> and now radio is the biggest, has been in the past, the, the biggest uh, provider of commercial impetus for the music industry has been radio, right? Mm -hmm. How would we have known if we hadn't allowed it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whether they want to or not engage the customers in, in the creative process, they're going to shape the brand anyways. So they might as well, because you may set out as Coca-Cola using a brand saying, you know, we add life, for instance, or we, we teach the world to sing. I keep bringing that up from time to time. <laughs> but in effect, it doesn't matter what the brand really says. It'll, it'll be transformed. It's sort of like that telephone tag game. It'll be transformed once it goes into society on the web, and it'll become something else. So, well, you know, there's the, a the sort of Darwinistic reality here as for for companies is that you can see that uh, you know, in general, maybe up to half of what people were offering, companies were offering, were faulty products that didn't add any value, but they were selling anyway, for one reason or the other, because they had monopolies or whatever, right? But today. If you don't add value, you don't you don't get to live, right? Because it's it's so it's such a short lived illusion of having value. Everybody talks about it, you're gone, and somebody else can bypass you immediately, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's it's basically this is a part of Darwinism in a way that you, you can't lie anymore and you can't pretend that you're different than you are. Uh, you can do that, but but in many cases it's a very short lived experience, <laughs> uh, and it will get even worse. I mean, you know this this sort of you know, once you have four billion people interconnected uh, through digital networks, you know, you, you have to add value. Otherwise, everybody will just completely disregard you. Absolutely. There's even at the core, what you're really saying is there's also a raison d'être, uh, a French expression for uh, a, a reason to be is, is uh, now being challenged because a lot of brands have existed by that control and default, but really never, uh, by distribution actually, in excess, uh, really never had the opportunity of the feedback from the marketplace. And now that they have it, their true core uh, vibrancy is, is, is at stake. And um, it, maybe it was never there. Maybe there was never a there there with a lot of these brands. And I think they fear uh, yeah, that. I don't know who said this, but I uh, forgot who said this, but there's, uh, there's a saying that says, when the tide goes out, you discover who was swimming naked. <laughs> Right. Back to the, by the fig right. leaf. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and now you can say, okay, there's lots of brands, lots of people out there. You know, now that the shit hits the fan in a way, you know, the tide, the tide goes 
out, then you realize, you know, you weren't there, you didn't have anything on to begin with. Yeah. It, it just looked that way, right? So, and this is very true for banking, for insurance, financial services, you know, what value do you add? And this is the first thing I tell many of my clients, you know, let's really examine what your value is. And, and how you how you make that bigger and what you build around it before you can ask how much money you can ask for your stuff yeah when you pull back the curtain of a lot of the advertising campaigns and the values that are built around pretty skeletal brands there's nothing but a little man with buttons <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean this is of course we can learn that from the media business but i mean if you're looking at newspapers okay you know people are going to stop buying paper mm -hmm. they won't be stopping to buy news but the paper was that that was like the 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 reason for them the embodiment of their value right now they have to make a new embodiment mm -hmm. right? it doesn't mean that their value is questioned it's just the embodiment is questioned right um and, and so car companies will become companies making wind turbines you know that's clearly a trend already uh and and car sharing and, and uh you know community owned cars and all these things they'll get into all of these things right they can per, they can mutate to add value but they're going to have to do it in a way that that the majority of the users want not the other way around like the music business has tried which is to say oh yes you can buy a you can buy a, a song for a dollar you know big deal Yes, you know, that, and was, the world... that, was, that was cool 15 years ago. Now, now it's like, you know, people want a virtual jukebox, you know, that's, and, and, uh, and they're struggling with that because it removes control of distribution. Oh, it's going to be interesting how this all falls out. What do you think is going to happen, Gerd? Who's, who's going to win or what kind of truce will there be? What do you see happening in 2012 in terms of this? Well, I, I think 2012 is, as, as many people has, have outlined, not a year of disaster, but I think it's a, a year of a major showdown of some of the really top level, level issues. Uh, who gets to control information and the Internet? Right. Will it be the top, not even 1%, but the top, you know, 0.01% or will it be the rest of us right? uh, who, who controls what happens with the environment, you know, the ones that make all the money or the, the ones who are, who are living on it, right? Mm -hmm. So all these issues will come down to head, I think, in many ways. In, in, uh, and going back to branding and marketing, I think a lot of brands will find themselves in a very tight spot if they aren't ready for that sort of eco-networked, you know, interdependent future, rather than the future of uh, controlling every piece of the chain. So if you're looking at the biggest success the last decade, you know, in general, like Amazon, eBay, Skype, and, and Twitter, and what have you, right, they're all, they're all decentral. Right? I mean, they, they, have, they have central pieces, but Amazon has, what, a million affiliates, right? Yes, yes. And, and the best example for how Amazon adds value is to say, well, guess what? You know, all the Prime members now have free, free streaming in the U.S. It is, you know, unfortunately mm -hmm. not here. But, you know, they, they keep adding value. They, they think in this direction of the network society. Uh, if you're not part of the sort of network society thinking, then you're going to have a tough future. That, that is sort of my summary there. You know, one of the problems was with a lot of these congressmen and senators that took incentives, if you will, <laughs> to promote SOPA, they don't understand the internet. And I would say that even the lobbyists don't understand the internet. And I would say that maybe even some of the, the, the leading brands don't understand the internet. If you could go and inject yourself into the dialogues and all these boardrooms with these corporations and help them understand, because it is complex. And that's the problem, I think, as well, Gerd. They need someone like you to really help them understand and simplify, because we make it complex, don't we, when we talk. The yeah, last... yeah, that's true, but at the same time, it's also very simple. You know, you can just ask yourself a question. Do you believe that ultimately the more control you have, the better you're off? Or do you believe in the in the virtue of collaboration or creating sort of a, a, a joint project? I think Al Gore said, if not, he quoted it from a Chinese saying <laughs> that uh, if you um, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. Yes, yes. Uh, I think it's a Chinese saying, but basically it's a question of what you believe in. And I, I think if we're looking at the fact, for example, in the U.S., you know, half of the uh, of the House 
uh, is, is they're millionaires, right? Half of the congressmen and senators are millionaires, right? So what are they going to believe in? <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and this is, I think this is a very, very big issue, especially strong in America, but also here in Europe, you know, is that, okay, you know, who are we voting for? Uh, and who are we representing? Uh, and this is the Occupy movement, of course, that is behind this whole upheaval of saying, hey, you know, we're still here and we are indeed the 99%. Well, what do you say, Gertz? Can we, can we hire you, the 99% of humanity? Can we hire you as our uh, lobbyist for humanity and exceed the incentives of these other boys? Yeah, I, I think that... Uh, me, just like everyone else who was uh, working in the sector, you know, we're, we're facing the exact same economic pressures. You know, of course, there is more money in the traditional system, you know, uh, advising companies who have the money to change themselves than to start scratch and, and to build on the other side, right? And luckily enough, you know, there is ways of doing it, like, you know, being an academic or writing successful books or holding speeches, right? Right. Uh, but I think what we need to come down to eventually is to say, you know what, there, this this shift is happening right now and clearly what I call the ego, the ego system will fail. It will fail on the internet, it will fail with the environment, it will fail with uh, what I call uh, sustainable capitalism, um, because it, that period, that window is closing. So uh, if it becomes catastrophic in that manner and um, they retrench, will we be able to flip the switch back on? Will a new internet begin with a new satellite from humanity? What will happen if they flip the switch off? Will we be able to flip it back on? Well, absolutely. I think that the uh, they can make this law just like they made the Hadoopian three strikes law in France, right? They can make the law, but it will be widely disregarded. It will not be actually implemented. I mean, it has been to some degree. I like a couple thousand people were uh, disconnected in France, I think. But it will not have any effect on what they thought it would do. Everything they try to delay is going to happen anyway. In fact, with doing this, you, you, you stalk the resistance, right? I mean, you, 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 uh, you pour fuel on the, on, on the flames of the resistance by making it even tighter. Right? And of course, the numbers of people who are different are growing every single day. So, you know, in my view, for example, this whole idea of, uh, you know, starting from media all the way to brands of, of that control mechanism is becoming clear to every single person in those companies that it's futile. Right? So what... It's just, we need leadership there. Mm -hmm. We need real leadership because, you know, uh, Obama in that regard, uh, President Obama has become a bit of a disappointment in that leadership. I understand why. At the same time, you know, a leader is a leader, and at a certain point, the, uh, you know, it has to stop. It has to become real leadership, right? Yes. Um, and, and so, basically, I think this is what we're missing in many ways uh, from the media industry, too. Uh, well, to you man, know... You know I we're going to be distracted too with the imminent uh, conflagration in uh, the Strait of Hormuz. It's quite frightening. Uh, I don't know how that's going to distract us uh, from our, our economic daily life. <clears throat> it's going to be. Well, a lot of things will come to a head this year. This may be one of them. I hope not. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's basically the system's very fragile now. And it's, it's not uh, the logic is at risk, right? It's not individual uh, it's like saying okay you know you you have a disease but you don't put a band-aid on and just walk walk around with it right you you have to go a little bit deeper and our disease is that this belief system is crumbling uh in many ways and, and i think there's lots of brands who are already sort of ahead of their time there right uh which is a good thing and there's lots of music companies also like beggars banquet and others you know who are ahead of their time there Right. But dragging along everyone else, you know, this I think this really needs to be the majority of people rather than uh, the reverse. Mm -hmm. I see the future of the free market system in in a, an unhampered web. Really, I see the tail getting longer and longer. I see the birth of brands, new brands, daily challenging old brands, and I think they see it too, because the trust is between peer to peer, and because a lot of the major brands have worked so hard at reducing their costs that really the quality, if you remember quality is job one, and the ISO, and in search of 
excellence. I mean, that all fell by the wayside. I see new emerging brands that can still remain economically viable, creating even more of a long tail in the economy. And I see that as, as a fear that they have, but also an opportunity. I see entrepreneurship and small business really taking off. And, but I also see that this may be an attempt to not allow this to happen, this natural combustion. Well, I think uh, this is a great opportunity for small, medium-sized companies to, uh, to take over. Uh, and if you see what happens, you know, as far as leading brands around the world, now we have companies like Tencent, you know, which is a, a Chinese company, uh, you know, which is one of the biggest brands in Asia. Uh, we have brands that are coming out of nowhere uh, and taken over from some of the established brands. I mean, just look at what YouTube has done to MTV. You know, uh, to to witness you know the huge change of like the sort of decentralized uh, user driven experience, right? Uh, so I think in general this is a great opportunity. But having said so, uh, there has to be there has to be a level playing field for people to compete uh, without being hampered by you know uh, thousands of regulations thought up by people who are currently in charge. Oh, you brought up the key point because these regulations are what's killing small business. I mean, they can't afford it. And this is in the, uh, the regulations in the physical world. And I'm sure they're going to want to apply that to the web in every which way from Sunday. But what is yeah, Tencent? I mean, you know, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have Facebook or YouTube or Twitter if there was a sober law in place, right? Yes. Because because you could have sued, uh, what's his name, uh, Chad, Chad Hurley, uh, after a week and put into jail for what he did right? and uh, the DMCA allowed uh, him to say well you know what under this law we can try this right uh, and, and this is clearly not in the attempt it can't be in the intention of an enterprising government and of an enterprising nation to come up with laws that that will prevent any such experiment at the cost of you know less than one percent of the industry having their old cake and eating it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is where the jobs are coming from this is this is this is how economies will survive. It, it, it is centric to surviving the economic downturns that we're all experiencing and uh, the, the debt that is crushing everybody. Now you mentioned ten cent in China. Uh, well, you um, it's the biggest brand of that they run in China is called QQ. Uh, just QQ, the, the two letters, QQ.com. And it's, it's like Twitter. They own all kinds of brands. They, they are uh, they're the biggest sort of messaging service and, and social media platform. Um, and it's run by a, a fairly young Chinese guy. I, I think they're on the stock market already. But, you know, there's lots of things happening like that around the world. We can clearly see a trend, and this is very bad news for America. Uh, I mean, you're Canada, but so you're safe. But, um, you know, the, uh, the trend clearly is all of the cool, cool stuff is happening in the developing countries. Right? And, and uh, in Brazil, India, Indonesia, China, Africa, right? Because there, they're looking to actually create value and reinvent rather than to stick with the stuff that they used to have, which wasn't, wasn't much. I mean, in terms of economy, they're, 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 they want to grow, right? And this is, of course, precisely one of the issues of their compliance with environment and so on. But they, they are the ones who are inventing stuff now. Why is it the Western world isn't inventing stuff now? Well, I think we're in still are. In comparison. <laughs> we are inventing lots of stuff in America still. But the key factor is that, you know, we, we're doing it on a very high level. We already have a lot of things. I mean, in Europe, our main problem is that we already have everything. So, uh, you know, if we're going to make 3,000 euros a month or 4,000 or 5,000, you know, we already at three. We're not at 100, right? So we're not at, as hungry. And, and we also come to expect a lot of things mm -hmm. from life and from services, right? So we're not in the position to gamble or to experiment as easily. And this is, for example, the Silicon Valley startup culture is that, you know, they go for it and it's, you know, it's all out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this kind of philosophy is, is, needs to be retained and nurtured rather than to be, you know, because that, that is the driver of some really drastic innovation. And, and this is where brands also need to bring in people that have this kind of philosophy to invent something. You know, the, the CMO of Euler Packard said a few years ago is that brands are not uh, defined by the campaigns anymore, but what by the ecosystems that they nurture. So what do they create that creates a larger story? 
and, and, and they can be at the center of this, but there's an ecosystem. Yes, and I think that might be something that um, the more established corporations uh, should consider is more innovation rather than more management of their legacy brands. Yeah, it's hard because basically, you know, the larger you are, of course, the more stuck you are with, uh, with mechanisms and so on. It, it's not so easy. But I think uh, usually, and this is one important point, I think, is that people don't change and companies don't change because they have insight into why it's better on the other side. You know, that yeah. just doesn't happen because that's an intellectual process. It doesn't have, a lot of times, doesn't have much result except for companies like Amazon or Netflix that, that are able to do this. But most companies change because A, because either they are under significant pain, right? they are in a painful place and they're going to die, and this is why they change. Right? This is what Kodak tried, for example. Right? Or they fall in love with some sort of idea. Right? They, 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 they are hooked on something that is good. So was, uh, in general, you know, people change when there's love or pain, right? And, and it's very much the same for brands. So, so that is a good sort of way to, to, uh, to start and say, okay, if you're helping a company, let's look at, you know, those points of pain and love and see if we can turn those into reinvention. Yes, absolutely. I'm thinking of the motto, if it ain't broke, why fix it, is probably the motto that's operating in their minds. But um, when, when you put almost all brands, all creations that are out there up against the changing world, I think all of it needs fixing. Uh, Forbes, I think, did a prediction that 70% of businesses would die for, for this lack of uh, flexibility. So I, I think that's important to warn, to, to, to give a caution to everybody that they need to be brave and evolve. I mean, uh, this is part, of course, of my job is, is to help companies develop what I call foresight, right? So uh, just simply asking a simple question, okay, what if, and then you fill in the gap on the, depending on which company you work with, you know, what if somebody invented something that would make what you have look like a, the lamest duck ever, right? Uh, what if some piece of your chain would just fall out? and go somewhere else right? and think about this and, and try to develop foresight as to what you think is likely to happen in the th next three to five years. And then if you do it without assumptions, you know, without uh, uh, sort of guarding yourself from, from what may be new, then you can derive it a pretty scary place or a very joyful place, depending on which way you're looking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, one of the, the uh, classic uh, examples that we're talking about is how long um, the car manufacturers held on to those massive cars, those, those um, what do you call them? The, the uh, SUVs, yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> the SUVs. <laughs> See, it's left my memory already. <laughs> yeah, remember when, when we had SUVs? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I think that basically, I think the job that we're going to see in 2012 for a lot of people who want to be, you know, causing change is, is to bring either love or pain to those that are about to change, right? Because that is the only way they're going to change. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there has to be some excitement about something. Uh, and then they're going, I mean... Pain, for example, Fukushima, the, uh, the nuclear c uh, catastrophe there, right? That caused a lot of pain around the world, and the Swiss government and the German government decided to get out of nuclear. Right? And, and, and the pain that was caused in, in Japan caused governments to say, we don't want that kind of pain here, so therefore we decide differently, right? Well, you right, got to right. give Germany credit, though. They've been ahead of the game uh, for a long time. I mean, they've been very self-sufficient on alternative energies. There's a, there's a city in Germany called Freiburg. Freiburg. Yeah, they're very close by, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's very self-sufficient. It doesn't use any uh, old power. But that's the hegemony that we have to overcome, isn't it? Uh, you know, I look at Microsoft. Bill Gates never saw the web coming either, you know. And, uh, by the way, he's uh, injected into this pro-SOPA battle. Uh, it's very interesting that some of these uh, players are also some of the technocrats. So we've got a, quite a battle there, don't we? Um, yes, I think we do. And of course, in a way, it's also a bit of a proxy fight, right? It's not just about the issues that are at stake here, right? This is basically a desperate move by companies who are feeling that they're going to be displaced uh, by a, a tidal surge of entrepreneurship 
<clears throat> that is coming out of the current possibilities like now of course everybody cannot think that a world would exist without facebook and youtube you know but this is precisely what a lot of companies don't want they don't want the facebook of tomorrow or the youtube of tomorrow because their world is changing and they don't they don't like that right so and this is really what it comes down to it has to be an equal playing field for real innovation that actually has a benefit for the large number of people it's kind of hilarious though because you can't hinder progress you can't hinder evolution you can't hope that the public will forget the web i mean it's just it's it's actually insanity we can't regress and and it's just not going to happen in my view this is my perspective it's just not going to happen so i think this is their final attempt and it's going to be a rather interesting year and it'll be bumpy but uh, i think in the end the 99 percent will ring well we'll have major confrontations on these issues not just that but also on a global level about all these issues that have been sort of saved up you know for decision making point uh, including the climate protocol including intellectual property protection and you know all these the trade rules i mean now a plane that flies from the US or Canada into Europe has to pay mandatory carbon offsetting right? as of January 1st um, because the EU decided that you have to offset, right? I know it's the, ridiculous. Yeah. It's you know you're hardly paying for your seat on the aircraft anymore. There's so many fees. They don't even tell you sometimes. I found out that 70% of what I pay at the gas tank is actually taxes. Yeah, you know, and this creates, of course, a huge amount of conflicts because, in the end, you know, this is a global topic. Uh, but the EU has taken the first step. Now, Chinese people have, the Chinese government just announced a few days ago that they aren't going to pay. Right, and, and so these are, these are all issues that will come to head. And, and as far as branding and marketing concern is concerned, many of the same issues are going to come to head. For example, the complete demise of traditional advertising which essentially has always been useless. It just never knew about it. Uh, and there was no other way to do it. Right? Yeah. But now, it, now, because of social networks and because of mobile devices, and you know, now advertising is essentially being completely reinvented. That's a trillion dollars, you know, basically, mm -hmm. around the world that is being reassigned. Uh, and 2012 will also be a very, very big year for that. So I think what we're agreeing on uh, after this wonderful, rich, uh, conversation. You have such a great intellect, Gerd. I think what we're agreeing on is that we're going to see the market change. We're going to see the players change. We're going to see new brands erupt, old brands wither and die. It's going to be a very different place in a year or two, isn't it? I think so. And I think this, this, is, uh, this is a good development because a lot of these things have been uh, percolating for a while, but they have to come to a decision-making point, right? And and the the question that I would pose to people, you know, are you going to be part of an ecosystem or are you going to be part of an ecosystem? You know, it's Very okay true. if you want, if you want to pick the ecosystem, that's fine. You know, I don't believe that's the future, but if that's the way you're thinking of the world, then you know, then uh, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be your advisor. <laughs> That's an excellent choice. Uh, ecosystem versus ego system. Wow. Yeah, that, that's my next book, you know, that I'm writing is on that topic. What a great soundbite. So um, you have a lot of hope for the future, don't you, Gerd? I think so. I think because in the end, you know, the only thing that is getting in the way is, of course, vested interests that are associated with power and money. And a lot of these things become unsustainable, as we see in the Arab Spring, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... They've had that power and money forever, uh, and now a lot of these states and families and, and kingdoms are, are crumbling, right? Because when when it's enough, and then it just it just cracks. And so you know maybe America is going sort of the wrong direction, but in the end, you know it it will crack because it's not sustainable. If we could kind of put the cherry on top by talking about the consumer, because that's a that's an old word too. We are not consumers, and consumption doesn't seem to be the paradigm anymore. How would you re-describe the new audience, the new peers vis-à-vis -vis the brands? But I think the bottom line is that I think we need to get rid of that understanding of the consumer. You know, to me, you know, an engine consumes gas, right? Uh, 
but people are so much more fragmented now than just being consumers. I mean, we're, we're, we're living in a world where there is like a hundred different types of people wanting a hundred different types of things. I mean, the fragmentation is everywhere, right? It's in television, it's in, in magazines, it's in, in, in food, right? It's more diversified than ever before. Uh, and some of it is a long tail, some of it is not. But in my view, it has very little to do with consumption, but with participation. Uh, and those participants are your customers and your pro- and your suppliers. Right? Again, this is why I call it the ecosystem, right? Because it's no longer like you're going to say, "Well, we're Walt Disney. You know, we have the copyright for these images, and you can print them in Tanzania." You know, <laughs> and therefore you pay us, right? I mean, this kind of logic is only possible in a completely controlled market space, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not possible in a network society because there's always a way to circumvent. Uh, and, and to recreate, and, and everybody's dependent on everybody else. So um, this is why, you know, Rachel, there's a new movie coming out, I think, from, um, what's her name? It's called Connected. Uh, not Rachel Boltzmann, that's somebody else, but it, it's called Connected, the movie. Uh, and uh, it describes that process of how we're totally connected. Mm-hmm. Well, remember that we only, you know, we're only like a very small way there because the real power is the other three billion as as uh, uh, there's a company with that same name the other three billion are becoming connected you know the uh, everyone else in the southern hemisphere basically is getting connected to the network right? right so when they come in they're going to really push forward lots of these issues right uh, and and they will not have this western agenda of saying you know it has to make a profit and it has to grow. It's not just that, right? I mean, there's lots and lots of new things coming in that are basically going to put away with this idea of consumers uh, and basically, you know, the uh, uh, this sort of regulated way of saying who makes and who buys and who owns and who doesn't own and so on. Um, and that's all going to happen in the next three to five years, right? I mean, these three billion people are not going to be like us when they get online. Mm-hmm. Right? They have their own cultures, their own languages. English is not growing on the web it's diminishing you know it's chinese mandarin farsi you know that that's growing on the web and these companies in those countries are going to invent the stuff that we're going to buy in america and in europe mm-hmm. well we don't make much anymore do we yeah no we we uh, we have i mean in many ways it would be uh, would be improper to say that there isn't enough innovation in, in, in america or in europe there is but in many ways you know there's a sort of hungriness and the uh, and the ruthless in- invention, you know, that, that is really tough for us in Europe in particular because, you know, we're, we're too comfortable. You know, well, we're the very, thing is, you know, as, as, as uh, it's like Seth Godin was saying in that uh, sh- uh, video that we both shared uh, and loved in the last few days, <laughs> I noticed that on your site too. And by the way, thank you for the retweet. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> America, uh, and frankly, North America has been largely in deindustrialized. We don't make much anymore which is odd but you know as you see the rise of a middle class the word uh, the the hegemonies don't like to hear the rise of the middle class in the emerging nations who are coming into this play the three billion you're talking about um you know the 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 profiteers will be looking for a cheaper labor pool again because they won't be cheap anymore and you see this happening i mean this happened in china and india you don't have um that uh, very inexpensive expensive labor pool and they're looking for new markets. So I hate to see America become so uh, broken by the fact that um, its economy is suffering and globalization that it becomes the most affordable labor pool. So don't assume right now that uh, America is uh, has everything. Um, it is suffering. I mean, 20% of the population is on food stamps. No, I mean, we're, we're, we're facing a crisis uh, that has probably been the biggest ever in America because it's a crisis of the belief, you know, this ultimate belief in what I call extreme capitalism, which basically means whatever makes money is okay. That's <laughs> you know, right. That was sort of the program for a long time. And ever since Reagan, you know, it's, it's been, uh, everything has been geared in this direction of saying, okay, progress, growth, profits, money, you know, and, and this system is derailing now because it's topped out. Well, uh, since Milton Friedman passed and, and uh, his voice on privatization and Reagan and Thatcher and so on, uh, it's shifted to Keynes, uh, which is all about fiat money. Sorry, I'm getting a little technical here, but it's government uh, intervention and handouts and subsidies and, 
in uh, this kind of collectivism, but I don't think that's going to make it either because it's sort of anti-web and freedom anyway. So it, it's a, it's a quite a mess out there. But I mean, these things are the same. Uh, there's some of the same thinking behind this, and I, but but um, basically, the ecos the ecosystem is a copy of what's happened on the web in many ways because the web is decentralized, right? It's the nodes are equal. Yeah. Right? Uh, there is a, a process of repairing if there's damage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's lots of chaos. Yes, that's true. That's the same than in the ecosystem, right? And it can be Darwinistic, right? But it's much preferable to an ecosystem, which would be essentially saying, okay, we've got two, v two TV stations, and that's that. Right? That's what we had what, in the 50s or whatever, right? I see the web as, as the saving grace. So if we kill that, we, we trigger civil unrest of the 99%. Yeah, but, but, but remember that, of course, that the web really can't be killed in that way because it has become like oxygen and like water. Right? Yes. And, and no matter how you try, this has become now something that is a, in Finland, for example, a legal right is to have the internet. Right? Uh, in many countries, I think there's like 20 countries where you can sue if you can't get online. Um, so no matter how you look at it, you can't regulate the use of air. Um, oh, well, yeah. somebody came out, some pundit came out, I don't know if it was a United Nations person a few days ago and said, uh, it might have been a politician in Congress, who said that the internet was not a human right. Yeah, well, you know, that, that is probably somebody who has his emails printed and typed by his secretary. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, you would not believe it. It's actually true in many ways. But in any case, you know, I think that is it, because that is the case. You know, this is inevitably a failed effort. It just throws a lot of distraction and noise into the system that we could much better use for other things which is to create a more fluid ecosystem that is a mutually beneficial one rather than an individually beneficial one. Mm -hmm. Your new book is called Ecosystem? Or? Uh, from ego to eco. From ego to eco. And when is it coming out? Well, I, I'm happily at work on it. And uh, I've been uh, talking to publishers. And I'm going to really make a big deal out of this book and put it out in the proper way, uh, not just on the web. I mean, which will not mean that it won't be available on the web, but it will be done in, in a larger way, including a few other things that I'm working on. Um, but basically, the subtitle is Why, Why Business as Usual Will Kill Us. I recommend that people buy your Future of Content, download it right away. It's affordable. It's a Kindle book. Uh, and do you agree that in the context that we're having today, that probably is the one that's available right now that's more relevant, right? Yeah, the Future of Content is, is uh, very much about content, of course. It's like a $3 Kindle book, so there's no harm done picking it up. Mm -hmm. and no printing is being done either. Uh, but otherwise, you know, if you want to find my other, I have like on a uh, at least five books that are available for free and of course my various uh, essays you know you just put in GERD which is my like the disease you know G-E-R-D uh -huh. uh, if you type that and free PDF uh -huh. into Google then you find all of my stuff and of course at mediafuturist.com you, you can see my my various books and G. Leonhard on Twitter so I'm, yeah. I'm very easily found just putting the name in Yes, and I'm particularly liking the titles, A Friction is Fiction, and The End of Control, which I love. This is what we were really talking about, and I, I would assume that's very relevant to our conversation today, correct? Yes, I mean, it has been written five years ago, and it was sort of a half-finished, I realized that as I was writing about it, that this issue of control is very much... You know, on people's mind, and it, this uh, what goes beyond that control is the, is you believe and that is necessary, right? And so it really was about the larger topic which I'm writing about now. You know, from ego to eco, and those two those two things go together. I don't mean eco in the ecological sense. You know, I mean in the connected sense, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and so. Uh, this is really the topic of the uh, end of control is also this topic, which essentially has been uh, merged into this book that I'm writing now, futuresagents.com. We have lots of resources, about 25 other people who are like-minded individuals publishing lots of great stuff, including my colleague in, in the U.S., Glenn Heemstra on futurist.com, who has very, very similar things. When's your next speaking engagement in North America? You know, that's right now I'm heavily going uh, uh, south, you know, Brazil. I do a lot of work in Brazil, uh -huh. Indonesia, uh, and, and uh, Asia. 
Um, but uh, I'm on PlanCast. You know, there's a, a site called PlanCast, which allows you to share travel plans. So <clears throat> if you put in, if you go to my website, you can see my travel schedule on my website. Yes. .com. You can see the next three months there. Uh, I think I have something booked in May, but uh, okay. I have to look it up. Well, we can, we're, we're working on that, aren't we, Gerd? Yes. Well, I just want to thank you so much. This was the longest interview I've done so far, but it was an important <laughs> one. I think uh, everybody needs to hear every drop of this interview. I think it will be very helpful, very insightful, and, and hopefully it'll trigger uh, a lot of this connectiveness and this, this streaming and flowing that we're talking about. I, I hope that you become a, a sort of a household name in the uh, boardrooms because it sure needs to get there. So, Thanks very much. Oh, you're very welcome. It was such a pleasure, and I'm inspired more so. And I want to do this again. I have a feeling um, in six months the world will have changed, will be on its ears, and, and I may be calling you for a panic interview. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready when you are. Okay, sounds good, Gerd. We'll talk okay. to you soon. Thanks. Bye bye.